I'm going to be in uh, Genesis chapter 28, Genesis chapter 28, if you want to turn there, and uh, we'll be in a couple of other passages, so keep your Bibles handy, and uh, amen, amen. We've been teaching a series entitled House of Glory, and uh, the fact of it is, is after Israel had been in captivity for over those 70 years, they had this hunger to get and make to build a house of glory. There were discouraging times in that, but yet they proceeded and and persevered through that and uh, built a house where the glory of the Lord would rest. And uh, that was important in every generation. But I want to go to the very first time in Scripture that something is called the house of the Lord. And it it starts with uh, Joshua chapter 28, and we're going to begin with verse 10. You know, uh, theologians say wherever there is a first, we build on that. And when there's a first time mentioned, um, it, it, it's the bedrock of what's to come. It might be extrapolated, it might be added to, it might be enhanced in other parts of Scripture, but pay attention to the first time. And so this is the first mention of the house of the Lord. Verse 10 of, of Genesis chapter 28. Jacob left Beersheba. Let's just stop right there. The word Jacob means heel grabber. You remember he was a twin. Esau was born and he grabbed his heel. He was also known as a deceiver. And so in the Bible, it refers to often the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Sometimes it just says the God of Abraham and Isaac. Other times it says the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I always like it when Jacob is included because Jacob is somebody like me. He didn't get it right. He struggled. He was, in this case, a deceiver. It's fascinating that that this is the one that he's, and we're going to talk about this in another passage in a minute, Jacob left Beersheba, and he set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth, with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. In other words, they're descending on this ladder or this stairway. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. And he's declaring now that I'm your God too, Jacob. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. <clears throat> And you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you. I will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep, and he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not even aware of it. He was afraid, and he said, How awesome is this place. Say that with me. How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of the Lord of God. This is the gate of of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the place Bethel, which translates the house of God, though it used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I am taking And will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, so that I return safely to my father's household. 
then the Lord will be my God. And the stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Fascinating passage of Scripture. The first place that the house of God is mentioned. It's mentioned here, and it's interesting because there's no building. There's no people. There's only Joshua who is realizing that this place is sacred, that this is the house of the Lord. He's in the outdoors, and he's experiencing this moment with God. And he calls this uniquely a gate. This is the gate of heaven. And I want to share with you about five things throughout three different stories that we're going to look at this morning. And the first one is, is simply this. We've already looked at this first picture. Number one is a gate is a transition between two realities. We have a, a gate at our house. We have a, a small wannabe Japanese garden. And you can walk out of this garden through the gate and it takes you from one reality into another. And the other reality is this open space that looks down over the city. But a gate always takes you from one reality to another. If you have a gate at your house, you might be going through that gate from your house area, your yard, into a driveway. And so it takes you from this place to that place. Uh, we have a gate on the property that's down on Cemetery Road. And when you go through the gate, you're entering from the street onto the property, or you're entering from the property onto the street. A gate always takes you from one reality to another. And Jacob says, the house of the Lord is like the gate of heaven. Second thing I'd have you notice out of the passage, and it's simply this, more on the gate, the house of glory is on the edge of two worlds, earth and heaven. Whenever there's a house of glory whether it's in the Bible or whether it's in 1922 or 2022. Yeah, I got confused there for a second, what century we were in. So it, it, is a, it is the edge of two realities. As a believer, I should always live in the edge of two realities. I'm a citizen here, but I'm a citizen there. I'm a citizen there, so I'm a citizen here, and the house of glory is always living in two realities. If I live only in one reality, I'm not living as he wants me to live. I'm called to live in these two realities. Now, in this dream, there were three things that he experienced. And I want to just pull those out for a second because there's three elements. First off is he saw an open heaven. And an open heaven is really important. Some people think we live under a closed heaven, but I want to declare to you today, as a believer, you live under an open heaven. There then was angelic activity. There was a ladder or a stairway, and the angels were ascending or descending. They were descending because they had received an assignment on earth to carry out from heaven or they were ascending, I'm assuming they have completed their assignment and they're going back to heaven for a new assignment. Now, how many of you remember the, the song, We Are Climbing Jacob's Ladder? Yep. That's a dumb song. <laughs> that's, a, that's a dumb song because you don't climb the ladder. The angels are climbing the ladder. Okay, if you're climbing the ladder, you're caught in religion and they'll just keep adding new rungs to it. And so that doesn't work. Okay, so... So the angels are ascending and descending, and in this process, there is the voice of God. He's speaking to J Jacob, saying, I am your grandfather's God, Abraham. I am your dad's God, Isaac. I want to be your God too. In fact, a little later, he changes his name from Jacob, deceiver, to Israel, the one who will inherit all of this land and all of these people, and it will be miraculous. And so here is the bedrock for what we see for the house of God. He 
pour, sees this stone. We received this word last night. He put, received this stone. He put oil on it. I believe it's a picture of his baptism. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But let's go to a second picture. The second picture is found in John chapter 1. Will you turn there with me? John chapter 1. And we're going to look at verse 14 to begin with here in John chapter chapter 1. <clears throat> because there's a shift now that's happening in the house of God. Started with this man, Jacob, who has experienced this moment with no building, just the open heaven under God, just him and God. Of course, we know later the temple is built and the glory filled the temple. We know later Moses erected a tent and it was the tent of meeting and God met there as well. But here we move into the New Testament and a second picture that I want you to see, verse 14. The Word became flesh. Who's it talking about? It's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the Word. The Word is is Jesus, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling, somebody say dwelling, dwelling, among us. Now, it's not just a dwelling, the Greek word here is the word tabernacled. In other words, He made His home here among us, and so in this picture, Jesus is becoming the house of the Lord. Jesus is becoming This place, he is the word. Now let's pick it up with verse 45. He's calling his disciples to follow him. In verse 45, Peter found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. My guess is there had been a lot of humor told and jokes told about Nazareth. And so he's doing a tongue-in-cheek humor thing here. And then, um, or else there was deep prejudice against it, and I'm sure there was as well. But in verse, the last part of verse 46, come and see, said Philip. Somebody say, "Come come and see. Then Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, and he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus said, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Now, he didn't see him physically. This has to be a word of knowledge or he he, he saw him in the spirit. I saw you while you were still under the fig tree. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. In other words, Nathanael thought he was by himself when he was under that fig tree. Could I tell you, whether you're under a fig tree or wherever you are, you're never alone. And Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under a fig tree. You will see greater things than that. Now look at this. Very truly I tell you. You will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. It's fascinating. Here's Nathaniel. It makes the point that he has no deceit. It's fascinating when Jacob had this experience with the Lord of the angels ascending and descending, he was full of deceit. But now here's Jesus who is tabernacling among us and was tabernacling with them who comes along and sees Nathanael who has no deceit and he says, I'm going to tell you, yes, I saw you while you were under the fig tree, but you're going to see greater things than that. You're going to see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, hold on. They're no longer descending on the ladder. They're descending on the Son of Man. Because there's an open heaven. There's the voice of Jesus. But Jesus now, 
the Word tabernacled among us, He has become the house of the Lord. He has become the house of glory. And he says there in verse 51, you'll see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, there's another picture of an open heaven, and it's found in Mark, Mark chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open. Somebody say torn open. Torn open. Let me just stop with torn open a second. Uh, this uh, is used in Scripture several times. And it's the, it's the Greek word. It's used in the Hebrew as the word rent. He rented, rented the heavens. He ripped the heavens open. It was almost a, an act of violence. Remember when the temple curtain was torn open. Um, by the way, that temple curtain is, was somewhere between three and five inches thick. And we're talking a serious piece of a pair of scissors to cut through that. And, but the Lord, the God out of heaven, rent it open so that every man, every woman would have access into the heavenlies, into the holy of holies. It was rent from top to bottom, not from bottom to top. If it was rent from bottom to top, someone would think that man did it. But some way, somehow, God ripped it open. And here at Jesus' baptism... He is ripping heaven open. I want to tell you this morning, He loves you so much, He will rip heaven open for you. He's that kind of God. So the heaven was torn open. You remember, let me, let me just spend more time with that. You remember also when, when that moment happened that it went dark in the middle of the day and the veil, the temple curtain was ripped from top to bottom I say it was an act of violence. It was because even rocks split open. And even there was a mighty earthquake. God will go to every length to get to his people to say, I love you. I care about you. I want to make a difference in your life. It was torn open. And so Jesus is experiencing this same thing. And the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. We read that portion about Moses or about Jacob, roll call, about Jacob putting um, the rock there. Jesus is the rock, and he put oil on the rock. And it's almost a picture here. Jesus is going into the waters of baptism, not because he had sin, but because he was setting for us a pattern. The sinless one is baptized. And this Heavens are torn open and the oil, the Holy Spirit, comes and descends on him. John says, rested on him like a dove. There was nothing in the heart of Jesus that would scare the dove away. And the voice comes from heaven saying, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now I want to talk to you a second before we move on in this house of glory, you need to understand that at the new birth, the heavens are opened for you. When you come before the Lord and you say, I desire you to be my Lord and my Savior, the heavens will be torn in that moment for you. Somebody says, well, I'm not sure about that. Well, check this out. Look at what Ephesians 1.3 says. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who has blessed us, where? In the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Go back and think with me for a minute of Jacob. He says, the house of the Lord is the gate to the open heavens. And so here is here we are coming from one reality, I don't know Jesus, stepping through the gate into a new reality, and it says he's blessed me in the heavenly realms. I live on the edge of two worlds now. I belong to earth, 
but now I'm being blessed in the heavenly realms. I belong there with every, somebody say every, every. spiritual blessing in Christ. Let's read it together because it's about us. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Heaven was torn open for you, not just for him to get here, but for you to get there. See, when you're born again, not only does Jesus enter your life here, you enter his life there. Now look at this, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him, where? In the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And so, fourth thing I want you to note, every believer lives under an open heaven. Every believer. That's so important. Because how many of us walk around sometimes going, man, I feel like I'm in the dark. Well, what are you doing in the dark? Come out of the dark, into the light, into an open heaven in Jesus' name. Amen. Because victory is yours under an open heaven. Now, do I understand what I'm teaching you? No. <laughs> I don't understand half of what I teach you. But I tell you, what I teach you is true because God said it. And because he says it, I believe it. And because he said it, I've stepped into it and I've experienced it for myself. So I teach you experientially, not because I have this knowledge that I understand. You are under an open heaven. There's some pastors I've heard that says the heavens are closed. Well, that's not biblical teaching. Because Jesus is the same today as he was yesterday, and he will be that way tomorrow, which means anything is possible in my life when Jesus is my Lord. Amen. And I'm telling you, that's good news. Thank you. Now, Jesus came back to the house of glory. You still tracking with me? Okay. Last night, they were like, man, I just got to take this in. You're hearing it twice, Matthew. Good. You getting this? All right. It's good. So, um, Jesus comes. The Word became flesh, tabernacled among us. And he says, John 9, I am the light of the world while I'm in the world. I am the light of the world. Say that with me. While I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. In other words, I'm not always going to be in the world like I am now, like I am tabernacled. Okay. While I'm here, I'm the light of the world. He warned the disciples in John chapter 12. Look at John chapter 12, verse 35. Jesus told them, you're going to have the light just a little longer. Walk while you have the light. Before darkness overtakes you, whoever walks in the dark does not know where they're going. And so the house of glory is about ready to leave, but he never leaves the church hanging without a house of glory. Go with me to the third picture that I want to share with you this morning. And that is Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I love digging into the Word with you guys. And I can almost hear the pages turning online from Arizona and Florida and Oregon and all those places you are. By the way, some of you watch Facebook, others of you watch uh, Grace Fellowship WI or live Grace Fellowship WI, others on YouTube, wherever you watch from, we love hearing from you. I'm giving these guys time to find the scripture. All right. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. How many of you know there's the first miracle? 
120 of them. They're all together. Now let me stop. They have been praying for 10 days because Jesus told them to tarry in the upper room. By the way, the church of Jesus Christ today needs upper room DNA. They're tarrying in the upper room. They are praying for what God has promised. And so here they are on earth. Have, earth is invading heaven. That's what happens when you pray. Earth invades heaven. And sometimes when you pray, because you're seated in heavenly places, Ephesians 2, 6, you shouldn't be praying from down here. You should be praying from up there so that heaven invades earth. Okay, sometimes it's earth invading heaven. Did I mention that as a believer, you live on the edge of two worlds? Did, I, did, I, did you guys hear me mention that? Because I, I don't want to have to go back and if, if I missed it, but didn't think I did. So, verse 2, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from, where did it come from? Heaven. And filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. So, there's fire on the shoulders or on the head or something of 120 people here, okay? How many of you know that would capture your attention? Okay. It would capture mine if I was teaching you and that happened. Oh, God, make it so. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages or tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Some of these who are staying in Jerusalem have been the same ones who put Jesus to death. Okay, Verse 6, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. Now, they didn't come because they were hearing it in their own language. They came because there was a sound from heaven. You tracking with me? They heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each of them heard their own language being spoken, utterly amazed. They asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Pergia, and Pamphylia. Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Christians and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? By the way, let me stop there. If we're never perplexed by the move of God, we've made God our size instead of his size. When he moves, I want him to move in his size. And that means I may not understand it and I may be perplexed. But I want God to move so that God can be God. I don't need him to be like me. I'm goofed up. I need him to be like him. He's got it all together. Some of them made fun of them and said, well, they've had too much wine. And then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you carefully. These people are not drunk, as you you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Now, track with me. The first picture is the house of God with Jacob. Jacob. The second picture, Jesus becomes the house of God. Third picture, the church, the 120, became the house of the Lord. Look at what he says, verse 8 of Ephesians 5. For you once 
for you were once darkness, but now you are the light. Jesus says, while I'm here, I'm the light. The light you won't have much longer. And now the church is commissioned to be the house of glory, and you now are the light. For you once were darkness, but now you are the light. Live as children of the light. And some say, well, I'm not so sure about this house of glory thing that it's me. Well, look at what 1 Corinthians 3.16 says. Do you not know that you yourselves, somebody say you yourselves, yourselves. are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in your midst? I just became the house of glory. You just became the house of glory. Does it blow anybody's mind that the God of the universe some way, somehow, miraculously made this his temple? Tell somebody he made you a temple. No, and I wouldn't have chosen you either. I, did, uh, he, I know he made you a temple, but I know it's weird. But I... <laughs> Come on. The angels are ascending and descending on the ladder with Jacob. And Nathaniel, you're going to see greater things because the angels are ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Nathaniel is one of the 120. You're going to see greater things. And you, Nathaniel, you yourself are going to become the temple where the glory resides. What was, what did they hear? They heard a wind. What did they see? They saw cloven tongues of fire resting on each of them. Look at uh, the prophecy of this. It's in Psalm 104, verses 3 and 4. He makes the clouds his chariots and rides on the wings of the wind. Jesus said the wind blows wherever it wills. You don't know where it's coming or going, but you can hear the sound of it, he told Nicodemus. And he makes the winds his messengers. It's the Greek word angelos where we get our word angel, messenger, angel, angel, messenger. He makes his messengers flames of fire for his servant, for his servants. So at Pentecost, there's a shift. The light was Jesus. By the way, he's still the light. But the light shifted, the house of the Lord shifted at Pentecost to the church. Now there's a fourth picture. And the fourth picture is still to be written. The fourth picture is Grace Fellowship. Or every gospel preaching church. Every church is to be a house of glory. Every church lives on the edge of two worlds. Every church is a gate through which people go from one reality, darkness, into a new reality, light. Our job as a church is to be a gateway for an open heaven so that people 
who are living in failure and defeat and discouragement can come into a gate, a new reality where the King of glory is on the throne and he does incredible. Number five, here's this simple, simple thing. We have a responsibility to bring that into this world. We have a responsibility to bring an open heaven here. We step in from here to there. That's what he's talking about when he says, your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? On earth, where I'm a citizen, as it is in heaven, where I'm also a citizen, because I live on the edge of both worlds. Do you remember that passage in Genesis chapter 28 where Jacob woke up and he said, I was in the presence of God. Let me, let me, let me, go, let me go back there. It, it's, he says, uh, surely the Lord is in this place and I wasn't aware of it. It, it blows my mind as a pastor how week after week two people sitting in church one can be wrecked by the power of the spirit because they're aware of it and somebody else like Jacob is going he was here but I wasn't aware of it it, it's crazy how two people sitting together one can just be moved of God and go, man, I want more. And the other's going, what time is lunch? <laughs> He's looking for a people who want to be the house of glory. He's looking for a people who will be what he said in Acts chapter 2 in the rest of Peter's message where he says the words of Joel and in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all people your sons and your daughters will prophesy your young men will see visions your old men will dream dreams even on my servants both men and women there was a shift at the early church too that Christianity wasn't a ma male religion. Women were included in the anointing. Both men and women. I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. So guess what? If you're a believer... You live under an open heaven. If you're a believer, you're the temple. He lives in you. And if you're a believer, you are the house of glory. So when you bring yourself a house of glory, and I bring myself a house of glory, and you bring yourself a house of glory, and we come together, we're going to have church that brings glory. And God moves on his people. And then it'll be easy to be a gate in Buffalo and around the world where people can go from one reality to another reality. Because we as believers, the house of glory, live on the edge of both worlds. So when the church is a house of glory, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit where the people of God are being launched into things we do not understand. We cannot explain. But we dare not try to control. Thank you, Lord. Tell somebody you're a house of glory. I want to pray for us this morning. If you're like me, sometimes I don't realize who I'm called to be. 
Sometimes I don't recognize where I'm seated. I don't recognize that I'm under an open heaven. But this morning, my assumption is is that you've heard the word of the Lord, that you're the house of glory. And I'm wondering, I want to just pray over us. Sometimes we are under an open heaven with clenched fists because we're trying to do it all ourselves and in our own strength. But I wonder what would happen if we came more before the Lord like this. And I'm going to ask you to go into that posture right now if you're open to that at all. To say, I need to receive. I need the awareness of whose I am. I know who I am, but I I need to remember whose I am. And Lord, with these palms open before you, I pray that you would bring the revelation that each of us lives under an open heaven, that we live on the edge of two worlds. We live in a world that doesn't live under an open heaven. Some of the places we go, there's just this little opening because we, the children of light, are there. That's not arrogance. That's just fact. But I don't make a difference when I'm not aware that I'm there for purpose. I'm there to bring glory. I'm there to release blessing. I'm there as a gate to help bring one reality to another. And I just pray that you would bless your people today with the awareness that you're their God. Even as their palms are open, not holding on to things that are not theirs to hold on to, but to release it before you that you've got it. You've got them. You've got their worries. You've got their troubles. And I thank you that we're not trying to climb a ladder. We're just witnessing an open heaven with angels descending with an assignment and ascending because they've completed it. Help us to be the people of God in this town. In whatever town we're represented here today. In in Fort Ritchie, Florida. In Green Valley, Arizona. In Phoenix, Arizona. In Windsor, Colorado. Wherever we are. in Illinois today to be the people of God and to live out the kind of faith that says I'm a temple and the glory of God resides in me I thank you for that in the strong and mighty name of Jesus and all God's people say Wow, I can't believe how God is just moving in unprecedented ways. And he's speaking a fresh word. And I can tell that uh, the online folks are just praying for us. And uh, we just don't, we count it such a privilege to be able to come into your home and to serve you in this kind of way. Your comments, your likes, your, your words back to us, your giving when you click on give, makes such a huge difference to us. They're encouraging Uh, to my own heart. I hope you just keep telling people about what's going on in Buffalo, Wyoming, because it's strategic. God's moving in unprecedented ways. And I just believe there's going to be an anointing that travels onto every person that watches and that God's word is going to make such a difference in your lives in the days ahead. Know we're praying for you too, and we love it that you're part of the Grace family.